Hi, I'm Gary Regenstein. Uh, this is a test run for a presentation I'm going to do in New Orleans on April 11th. The title is Curve Your Enthusiasm, and the premise of this talk is that although doing math because it's practical um, is good at times, like which cell phone plan is better for me, or um, just any of those sorts of sorts of, sorts of word problems, how do you balance your checkbook? Um, but a big part of math is pure math. And if you can get kids, I think, excited about pure math and they're doing it just because it's real and they're curious, you know, how do we do this, um, then those are the students who are going to go, you know, further in math. And again, not every student likes to analyze curves and the mysteries, mysteries of them, but as a teacher it's good to know about the different curves and I'm going to go through an assortment of them uh, in the next hour. The line is the most basic curve and you really can't do very much with lines. You, you have equations for lines. Um, one thing you can do with lines is you can solve linear equations. Like if I wanted to know two numbers that add to 10 and the difference is 6, I could do that by graphing x plus y equals 10, x minus y equals 6, and the intersection would be a2 and that will solve that linear equation. Of course, that linear equation is easier to solve without this graphing approach, but I think the graphing approach does give us an insight a bit into uh, how the two equations sort of interact with each other. So it, it is a worthwhile thing to do, but usually we do this, then we learn how to do it with algebra, and we never do this again. I'm going to show you that there's other equations you can solve with more complicated curves that you may not be able to do with, with algebra. The next curve that we do, fundamental curve, is the circle. And you can do a lot with circles. We get a compass and a straight edge with circles and lines. And you can make an equilateral triangle. You can make something like a perpendicular bisector. You can make an angle bisector. You can even do things like trisecting a, uh, a line segment. Those are things you can do with, uh, and in the real presentation, of course, these will all be the right size. So these are things that you can do with, once you are allowed to have circles and lines, you can create things, you can solve problems with them. One problem that you can do when you have a circle is something called doubling the square. First of all, you can create a square if you have a compass and a straight edge. But now, to make a second square now that has double the area of the first square, one way to do that, very clever, is to just draw the diagonal of the square and draw a square that has that as its side. Very nice visual to prove that this second square has area double to the original square is to just do this. And you can see the big square has four triangles. Compo it's composed of four triangles. The little one is composed of just two. You could also do it with, uh, with, you know, with algebra, but it's a nice, nice visual. So doubling the square is something that's possible with compass and straight edge. Now you can bisect an angle, and you can bisect that angle to get an angle that's one fourth the size of the original, and you can bisect that angle to get an angle that's one eighth the size of the original, and you can bisect that angle to get an angle that's one sixteenth the size of the original, and you can even add these things together to get something that's like three fourths the size of the original or three eighths, something like that. Squaring, squaring in geometry, ancient geometry, like BC times around Euclid, is where you get a, a figure, a shape, and you try to create a square that has the same area of that given shape. In this case, the shape I want to square is the rectangle, uh, AD, CB. And here's how, if you have a compass, you're able to accomplish this. Uh, the first step I'm going to do is swing this side BC over. So now I have a line segment, which is the length of the, the width plus the length added together, this horizontal line segment. I get the midpoint of that new line segment. I make a semicircle. I extend CB, and I see where it hits the circle. That length, BG, turns out to be the side of the square that would have exactly the same area. Why is that? Well, if I draw in these two lines, what you see is one geometry property is that uh, angle inscribed in a semicircle is always a right angle. 
<coughs> we also have the rule that you learn in geometry that the altitude run to the base of a right tri to the hypotenuse of a right triangle is the mean proportional between, in this case, A, B, and B, whatever you want to call that. And that's why we're able to square any rectangle. Now, if you have a quadratic equation, it's actually possible to find the solution, the one, two, if there's one or two solutions, using just circles and lines. I'm going to show you how to, how to do that. Of course, you could do it with a parabola, but that seems like cheating. If you, how would you make this parabola if you didn't already know what the answer is to these two things? Were? So the answer is 2 and 4, but I'm going to show you how you can get the same answer by drawing for, if it's in this form, you draw a horizontal line at y equals the square root of this c value. And you make a circle that, that has center, whatever half of this b coefficient is, divided by 2. Make that the center of your circle. And make the radius of the circle uh, the square of half of this. And as you can see, that also has intersections at x equals 2, x equals 4. And why that works, you can see, if you take the equation for the circle and intersect it with the line by, by replacing the y with the square root of 8, square root of 8 squared becomes the 8 that we wanted over here. <coughs> Whereas the x minus 3 squared gets me the minus 6x that I wanted, but this extra 9, pesky 9, gets canceled out by the 9 on the other side. So it's, um, and this, this comes from Descartes. So with the compass and a straight edge, you can do a lot of stuff. You can bisect an angle. You can square different things, including like regular pentagons, things like that. You can double squares. And you can even solve quadratic equations. But there are still many things that you can't do with just a um, compass and a straight edge. For instance, you cannot trisect a line segment, uh, sorry, a, an angle. You can't square a circle. You can't double a cube, which means to make a cube that's got double the volume of the original. These three questions, trisecting the angle, squaring the circle, and doubling the cube, known as the three problems of antiquity. And for thousands of years, people tried different ways of either solving it with a compass and straight edge or coming up with alternate ways of doing it, including inventing some of the curves you're going to learn about today. Uh, as far as for doubling the cube, one concept we teach in geometry is there's something called the mean proportional of two numbers. So the mean proportional of 4 and 9, you can solve this equation 4 over x equals x over 9, x becomes 6, that's the mean proportional. And there's a geometric interpretation, which is um, just like I did before, if I, if I draw this, this right triangle, um, 6 is going to be the mean proportional between 4 and 9. So I actually draw the picture, create the mean proportional with this semicircle. Well, there's also something called finding two mean proportionals. Finding two mean proportionals, if you have the number 27 and 8, you want to find x and y, so that's 27 over x equals x over y equals y over 8. This can be solved with algebra. So to split up, uh, take these two pieces and cross multiply, and then take these two pieces and cross multiply, get these two equations. Um, solve for x, isolate the x in this bottom equation, substitute it into the top equation, and ultimately we can get the answer. These are called the two mean proportionals. But long ago, they realized that if you can find the two mean proportionals between 2 and 1, it would, one of them, would be the cube root of 2. And the cube root of 2 is what we, is what we need to double the cube. So how do we do that? Well, circles and lines aren't enough for it. But if we can somehow graph these two equations and find their intersection. Well, they noticed when they started to graph these things, the first one looked like that, 2y equals x squared, and they graphed the other one, x equals y squared, it became that. And when I find the intersection point, in fact, it is exactly as predicted, the y value is the cube root of 2. So they say that the parabola was invented specifically because they wanted to know what does it look like, in a sense, when I graph these two equations, and that's how the, the parabola was, was invented. If you have a compass and a straight edge, you could actually make um, 
a parabola pretty nicely, at least points on it. This construction is pretty interesting looking. What I have is a circle that has a diameter where 2 is one piece of the diameter and y is the other piece of the diameter. And then there's a chord uh, perpendicular so that these are equal, we'll call them both x. So what we have here, the property is no matter how big I make this y line segment, <coughs> because these are um, uh, the chords intersecting in a circle, we could say 2 times y equals x squared. So if I just take this length here, this x length, and I translate it so that um, I, I take this point here and move it up so that it's um, this, so that I would sort of graph up y and then to the right x. So I kind of take this point here and translate it over the same amount. I get points on the parabola 2y equals x squared. Just like that. Now, if I take the same picture and I trace the circle, it looks like this. And if you use your imagination, you'll see that it looks a bit like the top view of a cone, which they say led them to the idea that parabola could be the um, cross-section of, of, of a cone when you cut it at the proper angle. That can be proved using some elementary geometry. Back in about 200 BC, Apollonius wrote a book on, um, on conic sections. And he used very elementary geometry to prove that if I take a cone and I cut it at an angle parallel to one of the sides, the figure that comes out is a parabola. Now, sometimes in higher math, we teach using coordinate geometry, um, get the equations for the cone, equation for the plane, and get the intersection. But this is going to be much more fundamental. This circle here, which I can move up and down, is a cross-section of a cone. And here's a top view of it. So if I call this, this side and this side x, this side I'm going to call a. It's a constant. Because we're cutting parallel, no matter how I move that circle, that a side stays as a. And I'm going to call the remaining piece z. So I have this circle. Here's the top view of it. So what can we say? We can say that az equals x squared. But z and y are proportional. Uh, z over y equals k because they're always similar to this big triangle and, and the big triangle doesn't change shape so z over y is a constant. And with that I get the equation of this, uh, of this parabola. y equals x squared over a times k where a is this sort of distance and uh, k is a sort of constant proportionality between y and z. So that's something from Apollonius Conics around 200 BC. A nice activity that my students like is that if you take a um, if you take a piece of paper and you put a point you put a point on the paper somewhere near the bottom uh, hold the paper horizontally and you put another point on the edge of the paper preferably on a blue loose leaf line and you make a fold from this point to the po first point you made that fold that crease is a line. And if you intersect that line with a line perpendicular to the edge of the paper uh, going through this point, we get this point. And when I do it for a bunch of points that connect the dots, it ends up becoming a parabola. And this leads us to the focus directrix definition of a parabola. <coughs> that every point, if I, if I connect these lines, I get this isosceles triangle so that this distance uh, from here to here has to equal this distance from there to there. Um, this is the directrix. This is the focus. So this is a nice activity. There's also a paper folding for an ellipse and a hyperbola. I encourage you to research. Now, a very popular curve is y equals x cubed. We use it as one of our sort of fundamental curves in math sometimes as a thing that they can translate um, move around, do things like that. But what can you do with y equals 4x cubed? Well, you can actually do something with it. It is possible to use y equals 4x cubed to trisect an angle. And here's why. If you use the cosine uh, a plus b formula with uh, a is 2 theta and b is theta, you get this identity. 4 cosine cubed theta plus minus 3 cosine theta. 
If I call x cosine theta, I get this equation. Cosine 3 theta equals 4x cubed minus 3x. And if I manipulate it, I get this equation. So if I graph y equals 4x cubed, and then I graph 3x plus cosine 3 theta, and I intersect them, I'm going to get what I'm looking for. Well, let's see what that, how that looks. We take our angle, we graph it over here. When you graph, and I made a big circle with radius 1. When I do that, this length will be, this little gz will be the length of cosine 3x. Once I have that length, I'm going to graph a line with slope of 3 at this point. So it's 3x plus cosine 3 theta. So I have my two curves. So where they come together is going to give me the x-coordinate of, uh, of where they come together is going to be cosine theta. And once you have cosine theta, you can bring it down, uh, you can bring it down here. This line segment here is cosine theta now, uh, or cosine x, I, I mean. Um, I should call it cosine theta. That makes this angle one-third of the original angle. So it is possible to trisect an angle if you have this, uh, sometimes called the cubic parabola. More stuff you can do with circles that you may not have known. You can solve, just like um, with parabolas, I mean, just like you can solve a quadratic equations with a circle and a horizontal line, you can actually solve fourth degree equations and third degree equations with a parabola, specifically the parabola y equals x squared, and a circle, but you have to figure out what the radius and center of that circle needs to be so that the four intersections, if there are four, uh, correspond with the four answers to the original fourth degree equation. Seems impossible, but it turns out, well, one, one way you can do it is by graphing x to the fourth, but that's, there's really no sport in that. Instead, I'm going to graph the parabola y equals x squared, and I'm going to use I don't know if I can move this. Yes. So here's the math. Let me move it all over here. This is why I rehearse. Uh, I move the 24 over to the right hand side. I turn this negative 15x squared into plus x squared minus 16x squared. That's, 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 that's the step. Uh, you sort of pull an x squared out of this term. Then, since my parabola is y equals x squared, I can now replace x to the fourth with y squared because of y is x squared, y squared is x to the fourth, and also take this negative 16x squared and write it as 16y, and I end up with the equation of a circle. And not just any circle, that is the circle that, if I graph it, and find the intersection, I get the four answers. An interesting curve that Descartes invented is called a, is, is called a uh, Cartesian parabola. And the way the Cartesian parabola works is that you um, you have a, a regular parabola, this purple thing, and then you have a point on the axis of symmetry of the parabola, and you have another point over here on the x-axis. And we make a line connecting the point on the x-axis to the point on the axis of symmetry. And it intersects the parabola in two places. And if I move my parabola up and down, and that point on the axis of symmetry moves with the parabola, it makes this interesting looking curve, which actually has a rational function with a, cube, with a cubic in the numerator and a linear in the denominator. Well, we do graph things like that sometimes in pre-calculus. But what most people don't know is that there's actually a use for it. Descartes showed that if I have a six degree equation and I make, if I make the proper uh, Cartesian parabola and I make the proper, oops, I make the proper circle, the six intersections of that circle with the Cartesian parabola will be the six solutions to that six degree equation. So he showed that, that you can do that, which is pretty surprising. The next curve I want to show you is the quadratrix. If you, the way the quadratrix defined is there's two lines 
there's a line going down this horizontal line and there's another line rotating like a, like the second hand of a clock and they're both going at a constant speed in such a way that they hit the bottom at the same moment that is called a quadratrix and with it I'm able to trisect angles and square circles so the most important point on the quadratrix is this final point, point J. The problem with point J, and, oh, and the, what's important about point J is that it turns out that it's always equal to two times the side of the, the, the radius of this quarter circle divided by pi. Now, that's great, and that would, having a line segment that has pi as part of its definition allows you to square the circle. The problem is that J point See, I know what it is, I know what it is, but when I get to the very bottom, that's the most important point, but it's also the point that I can't get to because at that point, these, um, these things are, are, are on top of each other like that. So that's unfortunate, but still, theoretically, it's interesting. Um, here's a little modernized proof why that AJ is, is that length. To trisect an angle with a quadratrix is actually very easy. All you have to do is put, just stick a quadratrix in this spot. Here's my angle. Get the intersection of the quadratrix with the side of the angle. Drop down this perpendicular. Trisecting a line segment is possible, so I'm going to do it. And then I'm going to make a parallel line and find where that intersects the quadratrix. And if I do that all properly, this angle will be exactly one-third of the original. It has to do with, so the line here is always proportional to the angle. Squaring the circle with the quadratrix is much more involved. Here's the circle, here's the square that has the same, uh, same area. Let's see how, how this picture was created. So imagine I just have a circle, and I stick a quadratrix on it, and we have this property that the AJ is two times the, the radius uh, over pi. So once I have that, I can draw a line segment. This little length, a uh, little triangle here, this is this small side is half the length of that AJ. This other side is the, um, is the size of the radius. And I draw another radius and I make a parallel line. And when I do that, these two triangles are similar and this base ends up being pi times uh, the radius. If I fill this in, I have a rectangle whose area is pi r squared. And then just like before, I can square this rectangle, and that's how you can square a circle if you have a quadratrix. Another curve I like to teach is called the conchoid of Nicomedes. It has a very easy definition. All you do is you have a line called the directrix and a point called the pole, and you have a point on the directrix. Oops and you draw a line through, through the pole and through that point. And once you hit that point, you continue this other distance, which is called just distance. When you do that, you get this interesting curve that has an asymptote, and it's called the conchoid of Nicomedes. If you go from this point in the other direction on the line, you actually get, oh, sorry, you get, uh, you get this, so you get this cool looking loop and if you mess around with, with where the pole is in relation to the stuff, you get different looking quadra quadra uh, conchoids, that is. Uh, the equation is easily done in polar form, but it's difficult to get it in, um, it's difficult to do it in rectangular form. So here's my angle here. A is the fixed distance. B is the distance between the, the perpendicular distance between the directrix and the pole. Um, th these two parallel lines, or just the distance between the pole and the directrix, shortest distance. So this line segment is A plus whatever this hypotenuse is. That hypotenuse is B over sine theta. The conchoid is useful for trisecting an angle. And here is, here's Y. Oops. Here I have a triangle with a 60, uh, 63 degree angle. And I have this horizontal line. If I move it, whoops, if I move this point on it, I end up with this EDB line. And that angle, it turns out, that angle ends up being exactly a third of the original angle when, 
Oops, that's longer than I thought. Hopefully I made this so I can do this. Yes, I did. If E is placed so that when you connect E to B, ED is exactly double BC, this will trisect the angle. And it has a very clever proof. I draw on this line. There's a rule that the hypotenuse drawn to a uh, <coughs> uh, medium drawn to the hypotenuse is half the length of the hypotenuse. So that makes these these two things equal. We also have this angle ABD is equal to CEB because of alternate uh, interior angles. And this angle C up here is equal to it also because it's an isosceles triangle. This angle M then has to be double uh, angle C, which means it's also double this little angle over here, ABD. But because CBM is an isosceles triangle, this angle C B C angle C B M is also double this little angle. So this is double, this is one of them. In other words, it's been trisected. So if you can find this point E so that when you draw E to B, D E is double the length of C B. E D that is is double the length of C B. If that happens, the angle will be trisected. And if it doesn't happen, it's not trisected. So the big question becomes, how do we find this point? Well, that ends up being impossible with a compass and straight edge. However, if I draw, if I have a tool for drawing a conchoid of Nicomedes, and the pole is the vertex here, and the directrix is the, this side opposite the angle, and this PQ is going to be the distance, if I, make, if I have a tool that makes this, and I make that distance 2 times BC, then where it intersects, where the concord intersects this horizontal line, will be what I need. And the angle uh, will be trisected. So that's a cool use of, uh, of trisecting the angle. And of course this is all very abstract, and you might say, well, students aren't going to care about this, they don't even care about bisecting the angle. But I think one of our goals, and one of my goals as a math teacher, is to try to get kids excited about, you know, this kind of math, just this, this, this riddle. It's like if you're teaching music, you want them to know how to play the piano or whatever, but if you could get them to feel the music and, and, be, and be touched by it and, and to play with feeling and to understand it, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, there's a little value in that, and that's what I'm uh, encouraging you to do here. Now, it turns out that a conchoid of Nicomedes can also be used in this picture. Um, this, this rectangle is a two by one rectangle, and there's a lot of angle bisects, there's a lot of midpoints and things here, but ultimately, we need, if we have a conchoid drawer, and we draw it here, and we get the intersection, that point there, I don't need my concord anymore. And I draw, I connect some dots, and some more dots. I will have accomplished doubling the cube now, because as you can see, this EA over AB is, is equal to the square root, a cube root of two. So the concord can be used for two of the three problems. The next curve, which is one of my favorites, is the spiral of Archimedes. Spiral of Archimedes, is what happens when a, when a point on a line moves steadily on the radius, goes from the center to the edge of the circle, at the same time as the uh, radius rotates around. And it makes this awesome shape that was studied a lot by Archimedes. <coughs> the, um, the equation for it is very nice in, in, in polar form, R equals theta. The spiral of Archimedes is very useful because one thing you can do is trisect an angle. Here's my angle I want to trisect. I, I stick a conchoid, not a conchoid, a spiral of Archimedes, and I see where it intersects the angle. Then I trisect this line segment, which I can do with a compass and straight edge, and I get this point. I make a circle through that point, and where it intersects the spiral, I connect that, and that will trisect the angle, and you can think about why that works. The line segment is always equivalent to the angle. 
a lot of these things I do kind of fast because you have the video and you can pause it and think about it. But these are the most accessible things I found. Uh, the spiral is also, if you have a spiral, you're able to uh, square the circle. There's also something called rectify the circle. That's when you get a line segment that's equal to the circumference of a circle. So here's a spiral. Of course, we don't have a tool for drawing a perfect spiral, but if we did, and we have the ability to get a tangent line to the spiral, what Archimedes noticed is that if I take the point of tangency, connect it to the center, and then make a right angle, I get this triangle. And he proved that this leg of this triangle has the same length as the arc of this circle. So if I move my angle, if I, if I move the point to, to this point on the spiral, I find out that this line segment is the same length as this arc, but that arc is one four, it's half of the circle, which is half of the big circle, so this arc, this line segment is one fourth of the circle. And once you have a line that's circumference, uh, that's length is equal to a circumference, you could also square the circle. So spiral Archimedes useful for two out of three um, of, of, of the problems. The next curve is the cycloid, and this is a great curve. Any grade level could ponder the question, what if there's a fly on the bottom of the wheel and the wheel starts to roll to the right, what curve will, what curve will be formed? Let's shrink this a little. And it's surprising that it makes this kind of like, what is this? Is it a semicircle? Is it half an ellipse? What is it? Well, it's none of those things. It is something called a, a cycloid. And it has a uh, polar equation that looks like this, which is a challenge for students to come up with, but it's interesting. The cycloid has some properties. Hmm. Forgot how I could shrink these guys. Nonetheless, there was a um, a problem. Don't worry. On the real presentation, this will this will be better. Where's my? So if you have you have a slide and you want to get from this point to this point as fast as possible. You might make a straight slide. You might make a slide that's kind of straight, uh, bent this way. Or you make a slide that's bent this way. It turns out that the rachistochron, if that's how you pronounce it, is the shape that would make this sort of bead or slide get down to the bottom fastest. Take a look. Not what I thought was going to happen. B to A. Well, I'll go like that. Got to fix that for the real presentation. Inverted cycloid was the winner. Oh, there it is. B to C. And well, try it again. Uh, I need to figure out how to make this guy a little bit smaller. I don't think I can quite do that. In the real presentation, this won't happen. Okay, another thing about a cycloid is that if you have an inverted cycloid and you have three beads on it, it's like a wire, and I let them go all at the same time, they will all get to the bottom at the same time. And when a curve that has that property is called this, tautochrone, I don't know how to say it, someone can leave comments about how to say it. Another curve is called the cissoid of Diocles, and this is a very cool curve. It has a very its property is very simple. You have a point on a circle, and you have this horizontal line tangent to the circle, and this other point opposite that top point. And a point on the cissoid is such that if you make a line segment connecting this bottom point to the point on the line, and you measure this distance CD from the circle to the line, and then you copy that distance down here, and you make a point there, that's a point on the cissoid. So that's what's happening. I guess a little confusing when CD gets kind of large, they start to overlap, but then eventually it's small. So that's called the cissoid of, of Diocles. It, as you might expect, has some properties. For instance, uh, I found this to be interesting. To try to find the, the equation of the, uh, the polar equation of the cissoid, we see that if, if this angle here, L, M, P, is our theta, M, P, which is R, 
has to be the same length of CD by definition. CD is MC minus MD. So if I can get an expression for, for MC and MD, MC and MD, and subtract them, I would get my length for R. Here's a triangle, right triangle, and as you can see, MC is related to this angle and related to the diameter. MC is diameter of whatever the circle is divided by sine of whatever angle I'm at. So that's MC taken care of. Now I can do a similar thing. This is a very clever triangle here. This is an inscribed triangle. Because this is a diameter, this is a right angle. So if this is theta, up here is theta also. For a couple of reasons. You put inscribed angle and uh, angle formed by a, a chord and tangent. Either way, we have this nice right triangle here that the hypotenuse is known. So MD is diameter times uh, times sine, sine theta. And remember, the goal was that R was MC minus MC minus MD. So we're back to this, and we get our equation. R equals diameter times sine theta. One more thing about a cissoid. If you have a cissoid made already, and you make a line segment, uh, if you make a line that's got a slope of 2 that goes through point G, and you see where that line segment hits the cissoid, and you draw a few more parallel and perpendicular lines, you will successfully double the cube. You'll find that MO over LM is equal to the cube root of 3. Okay, the final thing I want to show you when we study these different curves, it's always a question about how can, what's the equation for the curve. And you can see already from the curves we've done that usually rectangular coordinates aren't very good for these very complicated curves. So Isaac Newton came up with nine different coordinate systems, uh, including polar and the rectangular that, that we know, but also seven others. I want to show you uh, seven uh, different uh, of, of his nine. So the first, he calls them his manners. So the first manner was rectangular, which we know about already. We have this point A and P. The, the coordinates, the X and Y coordinate, are sort of the distance from A to E horizontally and distance from E to P uh, vertically. It's useful for lines, and you can even do circles and conic sections, but it breaks, it gets, it's, uh, it's not good for some of these more complicated curves. So Newton's second manner, same point, but now the x and y coordinate are different. The x coordinate, we have this extra line, and the x coordinate is how far p is from g, which is the point on the line that's perpendicular. And the y coordinate, sorry, the x coordinate is from a to p, and the y coordinate is from p to g. So you can see, as I move the points around, it has different coordinates. This seems like a pretty unusual system, but take a look in this in this system. Y equals x. Uh, becomes a, a parabola. Oops. Y equals x becomes a parabola because it's like a focus directrix thing. All the points on the parabola have y equals x. But even better than that y equals 0.86x, let's say, those points are on an ellipse, and y equals 1.34x, those points are on hyperbola. So this is kind of like a focus uh, directrix thing going on with this second uh, manner. His third manner is he introduces a um, another point, which I call h. And the x coordinate is how far p is from a, and the y coordinate is how far p is from h. So this is sort of an interesting system, and it's useful for an ellipse. Hmm. Okay, I lost my ellipse. 
that's too bad, I'll have to get that back. Um, but for hyperbola, x minus y equals 2.67, and those points will all be on the hyperbola. So this, this relates very well to the um, two-focus definition of an ellipse and a uh, parabola, uh, an ellipse and a hyperbola. Where my ellipse went, I'm not sure. His fourth manner, the x coordinate, we have this extra line again, and we can we have the point A, the point P is the point I want to get the coordinates of. We connect P to A, we continue till we hit the line I, uh, at, at, at I. And this is between A I is the x value, and this is from P to I is the y coordinate. And that's an interesting sort of way of looking at things. It ends up being very useful for uh, the concoid y minus x will be a constant, will make a, a concord. The seventh manner is his way of talking about polar coordinates. He says x is the distance from a to f. Uh, p is my point here. So um, if I imagine a circle that goes through a and p, uh, sensor a and goes through p, this horizontal distance is x, and then this arc, the actual length of the arc, is the is the y value. And this is kind of what we do for polar coordinates now, although we think of it as rotating and moving forward. This one thought of it as moving forward and then around an arc. Well, it's very good for the spiral of Archimedes, where x is sort of proportional, x is proportional to y. He didn't just define these coordinates, he actually did a bunch of stuff with them, found derivatives and, and things like that. The eighth manner is very unusual. We have A, we have the point we want the coordinates of, we have this A point, then we have this B point over here, and the, uh, the X value is the length of this arc, and the Y value is the length of this line segment. And this is unusual, but it is good for the quadratrix, because x and y are proportional, and when x and y are proportional, this makes quadratrix. And the final of his manners is quite unusual. We have a curve, in this case, like a semicircle from A to B, it could be any curve, and the x coordinate is the to, to get to P, we'd have to go around the curve and then vertical. So the x-coordinate is how far around the curve you need to go, this arc length, and the y-coordinate is how far above it. So that's an unusual system. It ends up being quite good for the cycloid. Uh, y equals x would be the equation of the cycloid. So, that's the end of my presentation. I hope you liked it. Uh, the real thing will, will, I hope, be smoother than those. This is just practice. Just wanted to see if it can be done in less than an hour, and it seems that it, it was able to be done in that time. So um, it'll go a little slower on the real thing. So hope you enjoyed it.